Good morning, everybody. Uh, we will call to order the uh, October meeting of the Douglas County Board of Health, uh, Board of Health to, to order. For the record, there is a copy of the Open Meetings Act in the back of the room along the uh, northwest wall. I do have official public notice uh, here in front of me, and with that, roll call. Okay, Wade? Here. Festerson? Here. Rogers? Here. Jones? King, here. Espinoza, here. Um, item two is approval of the minutes for September. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Motion by Wade. Is there a second? Second. A second by King. Roll call. Wade. Yes. Rogers. Yes. King. Yes. Jones. Yes. McNally. Yes. Espinoza. Yes. Item three is public comment. It's opportunity for anybody here in the chambers or online to comment on. Uh, board of Health items that are not officially listed on the Board of Health agenda. Are there any public comments at this time? Okay. Seeing none online, we'll move on to the um, action items. We have items um, A, B, C, D, E, A, A through E. Uh, all of them are ratifications. They went before the board and the board here is ratifying. Is there a motion to ratify items A through E? Yes. Motion by Waze, a second. Second. Second by McNally. Any, seeing no questions, roll call. McNally? Yes. Rogers? Yes. King? Yes. Jones? Yes. Espinoza? Yes. And Wade? Yes. Uh, item five, the health defectors report and issues discussion, Dr. Hughes. I don't know if it, we did, <laughs> I don't know what it is. See here, Okay, now you can hear me. Fantastic, thank you. Um, good morning, board. Um, I don't have a lot of updates for you. Most of my updates are coming in the form of presentations uh, to follow, so um, I'm sure I'll be up here a lot more, but um, I did want to just quickly give you an update on um, some of our building matters that we have going on, so I think I've uh, in previous meetings talked a little bit about just the different safety things that we've been working on in terms of updating our cameras, building security, um, things like that, and just wanted to let you know that all of those things are still progressing forward. We're working with our other building partners and expect all of that to be done here in the next couple of months. Um, we are also preparing to move into the 10 offices that were so graciously given to us by GA. Um, we're just waiting for some furniture, so hopefully we'll be able to um, spread out just a little bit there pretty soon. Um, also, an update in terms of the infrastructure grant that we received and the work being done under that. I wanted to let you know that um, some of the positions that we had planned to hire under that grant are moving forward. So we are currently working on offering our workforce development uh, coordinator position, which I'm really excited about because that position is going to um, really enable us to take it to the next level in terms of um, ensuring our staff are supported, they're getting trained, they're getting uh, professional development opportunities and things like that. So um, I wanted to just let you know that we are continuing to move forward, forward with all of those initiatives um, and also accreditation is uh, moving forward as needed. We are doing our initial submission hopefully by the end of this month. Um, so thank you, Jamin, for all of your very, very hard work um, on the accreditation. So other than that, I really don't have, oh, I do. I am sorry, I do have one more um, update that I wanted to share with you. Um, we uh, were able this past month to finally hire 
a deputy director. So we are very excited about that. Some of you knew, as I mentioned that on our administrative committee meeting um, a couple Fridays ago, but uh, Justin Frederick, who was our super or our chief for uh, epidemiology and preparedness, has accepted the position of deputy director. Um, he will be continuing to oversee epidemiology and preparedness, but a couple of his other programs are going to be handed off to um, other divisions to enable him to take on that new role, uh, but still be able to reap his expertise uh, in, in those areas. So we are very excited. He has actually been doing a lot of the deputy director um, kind of administrative work um, leading up to him accepting this position and has been doing an outstanding job of uh, really just helping us take Douglas County Health Department to um, really new levels and help us to be the best health department out there. So um, welcome, Justin. We're very excited to have you in that position. Other than that, I do not have any other updates for you. I have a couple questions. Sure. Um, when is the submission to the accreditation happening? Um, I think it's due October 31st. Is that right, Jamin? Do you want to come up and speak to that? Yes. Uh, Jamin Johnson, Division Chief of Health Equity and Planning. So the uh, accreditation application, initial application, will be submitted um, by October 31st, and then we will begin uploading our documentation. We'll have 12 months to get all of our documentation uploaded, and then um, the Public Health Accreditation Board will conduct a on-site site visit to make sure that um, we can provide some clarity to some of the documentation that we have submitted and that they can tour some of our facilities and um, have an opportunity to meet with some of our staff before they make a accreditation determination. So. We should, we are, we will definitely have the application um, submitted by October 30th at the very latest. Perfect. Uh, my second question, thank you. Uh, my second question is around the deputy director position. Mm -hmm. So you said he's going to be in that position and as the chief division or division chief. Um, are you having plans to hire somebody to take over as the division chief or is he going to stay in both roles? He's going to stay in that role. So uh, basically we've, reverted somewhat to the structure that we had before. So we had an anticipated that the uh, deputy director position would be separate from the division chief positions. Um, as we started to face some um, budget constraints and also looking at the fact that we had stood up another division um, for health equity, which I think has to be a priority for us, um, it made sense to restructure again a little bit just so that um, we're able to reallocate some of that um, standalone funding for a, a, a full deputy director position back over into some other areas to support those other things that we have that we really want to prioritize. So um, yes, as it stands now, he'll be essentially handling um, budget and finance contracts, things like that. Um, and then he will have also epidemiology and preparedness. Um, and then he has a couple of other programs, so vital statistics and lead most likely will be, uh, will be put under different divisions. So we'll hand off some responsibilities to make room for that administrative piece okay. that he's taking on. Sounds like a lot. Um, does he have some type of support or assistance as a dire deputy director? He will, yes. Um, right now uh, we are looking at how we're structuring support, if you will, but yes, um, I can't say a lot about that right now, uh, but yes, he will have some support. Okay, absolutely. Anybody else? I have a couple of questions, Dr. Hughes. Sure. Um, coming from the community, a couple of questions in regards to the COVID vaccine. Okay. Um, qualifications for him, um, hours of operation, are we running any clinics in the community, and um, if there is a cost for them. Thank you for that. So I can answer the last one first. Uh, the ones that we offer will not be um, at cost. There won't be any cost for the people who qualify for those. Uh, essentially, it will be open for those who would qualify for the Bridges program, which is how we're getting our vaccine. Um, we are not at this time able to carry private stock um, and we are not able to bill insurance right now. So we're not uh, giving private vaccine, but it will be open to those who would qualify um, 
that would qualify under the bridge program. So I, I can't off the top of my head tell you what those qualification benchmarks are, but we can certainly send those out. There's also information on our website, and so uh, people are welcome to go out there and look at that. Uh, but we will be, yes, offering some COVID vaccine. Unfortunately, it won't be at the level that we were before. Um, and I do believe that there are plans to also be out in the community doing some of those um, clinics. It won't necessarily all be at Douglas County Health Department. You bet. I have a follow-up. <coughs> um, so do you have any idea of when those clinics would be in the community, considering we are already, COVID is already hitting us right now again. So yeah. just trying to figure out what's the plan um, so we can have a sense of urgency and being expeditious about how we do this. We are already vaccinating. And so uh, those- In the community, I'm asking, clinics in the community. Thank you. Um, I would have to check with our clinic manager. I haven't looked at that in the last week, but I know that she was making contacts with uh, people in our community to make sure that those were set up. Okay. I just, I feel like we should already have that set up or have some kind of plan for that, considering, like I said, there's already rise in COVID uh, cases here, but also nationwide. So just making sure that we continue to have a plan and make sure we're ahead of the, the curve versus us waiting until again, being reactionary to uh, these cases are rising. Absolutely, and yes, we are, we are making those plans with our partners and we are already offering the vaccine. Jamin, I think, has something that he wants to add to that. Yes, thank you, Dr. Hughes. I did want to just point out, so our clinic supervisor has been coordinating with community partners um, to set up clinics um, all over Douglas County. One of the challenges is we're trying to coordinate so that we can have um, a mix of providers since we have limitations in being able to provide vaccine to people um, who either are insured or have uh, Medicaid. Um, so we're trying to bridge that by building um, collaborative uh, vaccination clinics so that, so that other providers can provide vaccine to those people who we are unable to vaccinate at this time. So there are clinics being established throughout the city. Um, I think that at this point, our clinic supervisor has been in contact with about seven or eight community uh, partners uh, to establish those clinics. Thanks. I'd just add that um, you can order the four free tests again from the government, so it'd be helpful for to get the word out um, about that on covidtest.gov. And anyone that maybe comes into the Douglas County Clinic, um, like I just do it during my normal clinical encounters um, while they're there, so anyone can order them for them and they get mailed to their house. Wonderful, thank you for that. And we do still have a handful of tests available for free out front uh, at our building as well. So, I mean, I mean um, did clinics ever go down? Because I was seeing regular stuff of the vaccine notification go down. Are, are, do the clinics go down? What's the, what's, yeah, I mean, when you, we explained to me because I would see the weekly notification of saying there were vaccines at certain spots. So, I mean, did it, to it did not totally go down, did it? You know, I think there there were maybe maybe like a month or two over the summer where uh, we weren't out in the community as much, but certainly as the booster uh, came out, we were getting back out there, making plans to get back out there. And I, I don't know right now off the top of my head what that looks like, um, and I would be happy to have Molly put that together and share that with you. Okay, all right. All right. Seeing none, um, are you transitioning to uh, item six? Okay, go sure. Ahead. Okay, so transitioning into um, our big, uh, one of our big things that we wanted to talk about today. Um, as you've probably seen in the news and uh, maybe read about, um, at the end of September, beginning of October, there was a kitten here in Omaha that tested positive for rabies and um, Unfortunately, that was found to be a type of rabies that is not found here in the Midwest normally. Um, it's a raccoon variant, so typically found in raccoons and uh, commonly on the East Coast. And so this is not something that you would typically find here in, in Douglas County. Um, 
there were 10 people that we identified from this uh, rabid kitten that had potential exposure that we recommended for post-exposure prophylaxis. And all of those individuals have started that treatment and are doing very well. Um, there is, of course, a concern. Where did it come from? How did it get here? And uh, is it actually here? And if, uh, if it is here, how do we respond? So we were very lucky to be able to uh, work with Nebraska DHHS and USDA and the CDC to bring some experts here to Douglas County. And so we have on, our, on the ground right now um, several uh, Epidemic Intelligence Service officers from the Centers for De Disease Control. Uh, we're hosting them at Douglas County Health Department. And uh, also the Nebraska Humane Society is, is also kind of co-hosting them, if you will. And there are several activities that are going to be happening there. And I do have, um, I do have some partners here today who can help fill in my gaps here. Um, and I'll have uh, Ms. Sydney Stein come up and, and uh, give you a, a quick update from the CDC perspective here in just a minute. Uh, but basically what we want to do, our, our big goal here is to ensure that uh, if, if there is actually raccoon rabies here, that we are limiting and eliminating the spread as much as we are possibly able to do that. And the reason for that is raccoons are, are wildlife that typically are interacting with our domestic animals that are then coming into our homes. And so that presents not just a larger risk for our pets, uh, but also for other wildlife in the area and um, for humans, uh, because there is a much higher uh, possibility for an exposure to happen from a, an infected domestic animal. So we are uh, working on looking to see, first of all, if it's actually here. So we're doing what we call enhanced surveillance, uh, basically in conjunction with the Humane Society, uh, out there collecting animals that are already dead, roadkill, things like that, and testing those specimens to see if rabies is present. And then the USDA will also be coming on the ground, I believe this weekend. Um, actually, we have a few that are already here and have been knocking on doors in, in the neighborhoods around where this kitten was found and getting permission from landowners to be able to set traps. Uh, on their property, and the goal there is to trap raccoons, be able to vaccinate them in the trap, and then they're released right there where they're caught. Um, so we're basically trying to build some herd immunity, if you will, in that area, uh, in that raccoon population in case it is actually here. Um, this is a big concern on the East Coast. Uh, millions of dollars have, have been spent in prophylaxing individuals who have had exposures and trying to manage that from the wildlife perspective. So we definitely don't want that happening um, here, besides the fact that rabies is almost always fatal for humans. So we uh, definitely, definitely want to keep exposures um, from happening here. Uh, so this will be going on for several weeks at least, and uh, we've been trying to be out in the community talking about these activities and what we're doing so that uh, we can get uh, cooperation from the public. And I'm very happy to report that it sounds like that is going really well. It sounds like they're, uh, the USDA people who are out knocking on doors are getting a great response so far. So that is really great to hear. Um, we certainly cannot do what we need to do with this if we don't have um, really the participation from the people who live here. So we're very grateful for that. So that's a really fast update, but I wanted to invite uh, Sydney Stein up from the CDC and Dr. Buss. Do you wanna go first, Dr. Buss? Okay, uh, Dr. Buss is our state veterinarian and officer with the United States Public Health Service. Um, and both of them wanted to come today to uh, give you a bit of an update as well. So thanks, Lindsay, and I'm um, really glad we have the opportunity to, to present to you guys today. I'm going to let Sydney talk mainly about... Dr. Bush, um, you want to give you a, your name oh, and, yeah. um, and the agency for the record? Yeah, um, I'm just going to try to get to that. Um, I'm uh, Dr. Brian Buss. I'm a captain in the U.S. Public Health Service, and I'm assigned to the Centers for Disease Control. And my duty station is at the Nebraska State Department of Health. I've been here 
in uh, various roles as an assignee from CDC at the state for um, to start my 18th year. And as Lindsay said, I serve as state public health veterinarian and uh, have been in that role since like 2011. So I'm a CDC assignee here and mainly here today to talk about the CDC activities. So when this detection happened and, and we got the variant typing to know that this was a concerning variant, um, it's not typically found in Nebraska. And, and as, as Lindsay mentioned, uh, it was quite a concern. And in Nebraska, we have bat rabies and skunk rabies, but raccoon rabies has generally been maintained um, and kept limited to the eastern part of the U.S. And this detection now is 855 or 850 miles farther west than it's ever been detected. So um, it's very concerning. And Lindsay gave a pretty good description of the team that's been assembled. Um, with CDC, there's a, a mechanism called an EPI-AID, and Lindsay mentioned the Epidemic Intelligence Service. Um, the Epidemic Intelligence Service is, is CDC's kind of a crown jewel for training for applied epidemiology. And a lot of your top epidemiologists in the country that serve as state epidemiologists or high-level people that work at CDC or, or in different agencies with public health are trained through this EIS program. It's often called the Disease Detected Program. Um, Sydney, uh, we had the great fortune of uh, matching with Sydney. We have a matching process um, when officers come on and, and states and um, different centers at CDC will uh, interview officers and have a matching process. And we were fortunate to have Sydney match with our state. So she was assigned here for a two-year program and started that this summer. And in that program, it's a, it's a two-year training program for her to come out as a very well-trained applied epidemiologist. So she's getting some pretty good boots on, it, on the ground experience here. So the EPI-AID process is an opportunity for the state to ask CDC to come and bring a team to Nebraska. Um, we've done this in other events and other times when we've needed expertise and, and help with CDC. So our state epidemiologist invited a CDC team to come and with uh, Sydney being um, on site here in Nebraska already with her assignment, she's leading this team to support this response. So uh, uh, Lindsay can talk to a lot of the components um, and we're here today kind of to talk specifically to the, to the CDC activities. Um, my role um, as a, a full-time CDC assignee here is to be a liaison um, between CDC and, and all of the other partners here, and then Sydney's tasked with, with, with leading this team. So I'd like to introduce Sydney Stein. Um, like me, she's, she's a veterinarian. Um, how fitting it was that we had a veterinarian here on the ground to lead this team. Um, Sydney's got very good experience in, in uh, laboratory processes, and um, I couldn't think of a better person to bring to Douglas County and have CDC offer here to lead this activity. So Sydney, if you wanna talk a little bit about the composition of the team and um, introduce yourself first, obviously, and, and then some of the objectives. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I'm Dr. Sydney Stein, and um, I am the, as Dr. Hughes and Dr. Buss have mentioned, I am the Epidemic Intelligence Service Officer that is assigned to the Nebraska Department of Health and Human Services for the next two years. And um, because this is my jurisdiction, whenever the epi aid was called, determined that we needed additional technical assistance from CDC headquarters, I was put in place to lead the team. There are an additional three EIS officers that are here. Two of them are from the Pox and Rabies branch at CDC headquarters. And then we have another veterinarian who has come from um, her assignment at the New Jersey um, State Department of Public Health to assist, as well as a laboratory leadership leadership service fellow um, who has come to assist us with the testing capabilities. Um, the team is already off to a good start. We are employing what is called a lateral flow device. It's very similar to what you would um, see in your at-home COVID tests where we do take a um, specimen of the brain which would have the rabies virus and then we can rapidly diagnose whether rabies is present. Now, um, I did want to clarify, as we're doing this testing, we do not know what the variant is if we find a positive on this rapid diagnostic. So we are sending those samples back to CDC headquarters for uh, confirmatory PCR that rabies is present, as well as sequencing to determine the variant. 
Um, we have begun testing. We're still standing up and scaling up so that we can get through as, as many animals are coming in from normal animal control operations. Um, but as of yet, we have not detected another positive rabies case through our enhanced surveillance. And I'm open to any questions that you might have about what we're doing. Uh, more about the rabies itself. So is it, so it's called raccoon rabies, but it can be carried or passed through any other uh, animal, dom uh, domestic or wildlife? Yeah, so um, rabies virus is rabies virus. I guess that's a simple way to put it. So um, regardless of the variant or the strain or the type of rabies, it can affect any mammal. So in this instance, um, it was a kitten that was infected and to better understand the epidemiology or how rabies is affecting wildlife in our community or domestic animals, um, we do like to try to get this typing done. So we sent it to our diagnostic lab in Lincoln um, for the original test and it came through the Humane Society. I don't know, it was, no, I'm sorry. It came through a veterinarian in this community and that veterinarian very astutely detected that it was most likely rabies and then sent that animal to the veterinary diagnostic lab. So they do the original test that just determines if it's rabies or not. And then beyond that, then it was sent for this variant typing. Um, they did it initially in the lab in Lincoln. It showed up as raccoon rabies. We wanted to confirm it with CDC and then CDC confirmed it as raccoon rabies. So the, the, the risk of raccoon rabies isn't any greater than skunk rabies um, to other types of animals. Um, it's just very concerning here is that we've got a naive population of raccoons that have never been exposed to it. And if this could happen to get into raccoons in this state, then we could have a really serious outbreak in raccoons. And then like Lindsay mentioned, like on the East Coast, then there'd be far more wildlife exposures, far more domestic animal exposures, and then possible exposures with people. So it's very important right now for the community to be thinking about what do I do with my pets and my animals? And it's very important that they be going to veterinarians regularly. It's very important now that our community doubles down on making sure that their cats and dogs and ferrets are vaccinated to protect them. Because vaccinated pets and vaccinated companion animals is our best barrier as humans so that we don't get exposed to rabies. Domestic animals and dogs and cats tend to have more contact with wildlife. And then if they get it, then that's the risk to people. And like Lindsay mentioned, in this situation, even though we don't know how that kitten got the rabies and how that rabies got here, we do know that 10 people were exposed. And that's very costly to have them get the post-exposure treatment. So that's one of the most important things that we can stress right now is to make sure that our community is vaccinating their pets. Thank you. Question. Could you please share with us um, signs and symptoms that the public should be looking for um, to be able to report to us? You wanna take it? Yes, so rabies, the sort of thing that you always think of is increased aggression, excessive drooling, um, but there are other signs as well. So especially in wildlife, they should not normally be coming up to, to people, um, to the public. They should stay away. If they are approaching the public, even if they are not being aggressive, um, overly timid behavior is also a potential sign. Animals can also have- They, they meaning raccoons. Uh, any wildlife, any wildlife okay. um, also stray or unowned animals. This is the same if for talking about feral cats. Um, another thing that we would want people to look at is particular neurologic signs. So sometimes the animals are having trouble moving. They could be having seizures, um, be unable to walk. Um, those are also concerning signs for us. And so we urge the public if you are coming across wildlife, please do not approach them, stay away. Please monitor your animals so that they are not having contact with wild animals at this time. And again, to make sure that our own um, pets are being vaccinated against rabies in case they were to have an encounter um, with wildlife or a, a stray animal that may be carrying rabies. Um, and how about in humans? What would be the sign and symptoms? 
For humans that are concerned about having exposure, we would urge that they contact their healthcare provider as well as the Douglas County Health Department and we would go through our normal rabies surveillance. And in that case, we would recommend that they receive post-exposure prophylaxis if there was an ex a potential exposure. In that case, um, it is very effective at treating humans who have been exposed to not go on to develop rabies. Um, the symptoms in humans, we only in the United States have between one and three human deaths per year because we have such a strong rabies surveillance and um, the ability to get people post-exposure prophylaxis. And so if anyone is concerned that they may have had an exposure, again, please contact the Douglas County Health Department and seek medical attention with your provider and then they will uh, determine. Um, thank you, that's helpful. So a couple of things. So as far as the dog vaccine, um, that's every like one to three years. And are there resources for folks who maybe not be able to pay for that? I know that's pretty costly when you take your dog to the vet. Yeah, I can speak to that. So um, according to Nebraska statute and rules and regulations, every dog and cat should be vaccinated at 12 weeks of age and then have a booster a year later. So at one month and, I mean, sorry, one year and three months. And then after that, they should be vaccinated according to the vaccine label. So some vaccines are labeled for three years mm -hmm. and some are labeled for one. So it'd be up to the veterinarian to use a USDA licensed vaccine to make, to make those decisions. So it would be dependent on what vaccine is used. Um, but there, there are vaccines that can be used in dogs and cats that are, that, that are three year vaccines. And, and are there then, any resources? Yeah, as far as resources, um, that would be dependent on the local communities. And um, I, I really can't speak to what happens in, in each, each jurisdiction around the state. Um, Lindsay, do you, have, do you have an answer for that? If, if there's any opportunities in, in Douglas County? Would That, that one's a little, I, I, you know, our CDC team really isn't involved with, you know, the, 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 the normal activities in Nebraska. Um, so it's a very good question. And, and, and Lindsay, I think it's worth looking into. Dr. Buss, let me ask, uh, I see. So Steve, are you um, Steve Glant? Does the Humane Society have anything? I don't know if he's on. I see he's on. I'll ask. I'm here. I just couldn't find the mute okay. button. Sorry about that. Hey, does does it, is it possible the Humane Society might? I'd have to check on that. Um, I don't believe that we're going to have um, any uh, additional resources that other vet clinics um, currently offer um, and, and add any cost savings. But I can check on that and, and I can let everybody know. Okay. Appreciate it. Seems like a good idea, particularly for the folks in the area where the exposure was, to make sure that they have that opportunity. And then for those who need the post-exposure prophylaxis, um, is that up to them to cover that cost? Because I know that can also be costly. Again, I, I think that kind of depends on, on what's available in each jurisdiction. Um, but generally, um, public health will make recommendations on whether post-exposure prophylaxis is needed. And then at that point, it becomes a clinical process and that person should work through the medical community to, to get to seek care. You know, and so, I know we yeah. usually refer people to the ER. Is that something we should continue to do? I don't want to overwhelm our ERs with people who are concerned about this either. I, I can't speak to, to, to what is probably the best process here in Douglas County. Um, I know Lindsay's team um, gets these questions all the time, so I'll probably defer to Lindsay on that. One thing I will say, though, is that um, us as public health, when we make uh, a, a determination and help with a risk assessment on whether a person needs post-exposure prophylaxis, at that time, the order to give it is a medical decision and it needs to come from a medical provider. So go ahead, Lindsay. Yeah, and to, to answer that, thank you so much for that question. Um, and it has come up also for us. Um, if we do identify someone who needs post-exposure prophylaxis and they can't afford that treatment, um, what do we do? So current, currently the process is, like you said, um, we would refer them either to their primary care physician or if they don't have one, we would refer them to um, 
a, a local urgent care or emergency room. Um, we, we just started having conversations internally about how do we manage this if, if it comes up, if, if someone needs this and can't get it. So um, we don't have that answer yet, but I want you to know that we certainly uh, have started talking about it and are hoping to find a good solution because that's, that is a reality. Um, and I've heard that there are some low cost um, vaccine clinics that happen for rabies um, through some veterinarians, but I, I don't know that who that is or where that is. And so we have still some legwork that we need to do to help get that information put together and out to the public. Um, and this, this response is really still very new. Uh, we're about three days in, uh, four days in. So CDC just landed on, on Saturday and we got them set up on Sunday and hit the ground money, running on Monday morning. So uh, we're, we're still kind of fresh, if mm -hmm. you will, and we will certainly make sure you all, you all get updates as we go. Thank you, because as a primary care doctor, um, I know the delay, I don't want to delay care, right. um, first of all, because it can take several days until I get that message, and then to then say, go to the ER, yep. um, because we don't carry that in our clinics, um, oftentimes around Omaha. So. Yeah, agreed, and, thank you. And, Ray, Ray and just, Dr. Um, just, just, and, just quickly, if I can um, stay with that. Hold on, um, I'll, I'll come to you. Who, who is that online? That's Chad. Oh, go ahead, Chad. I was just going to mention, so um, we do... Hey, when we identify yourself. With, identify yourself, Chad. Chad Wetzel from the epidemiology section at the health department. Okay. And one thing we do when we consult with any individuals that were potentially exposed is we typically, we do try to get them into their primary care providers, but it is very difficult for primary care providers to order that um, post-exposure prophylaxis. So a lot of them get um, referred to infectious disease providers as the, as the first option. Um, because they don't have to go into emergency rooms, um, but it, sometimes it is a, as a last resort or a very, very emergency or emergent situation that they need to um, go to emergency room for that. Um, but most of the time we try to get them into an infectious disease provider in town that can administer the PEP. Hey, can I hey, this is, sorry, this is Justin, uh, Deputy Director. We also, um, and I apologize, Dr. Hughes, when we were talking about this the other day, but there are vaccine manufacturers that will give discounted rates for the vaccine. And I can't remember if it's dependent on income, uh, but uh, Chad's team is pretty well versed in that and will work with uh, exposed individuals to make sure that they can access vaccine at an affordable cost. And, and thank you, um, Justin and Chad. And, and just to follow on, uh, after a rabies exposure, the post-exposure prophylaxis is a medical urgency. Um, I wouldn't define it as a medical emergency at that point. Um, so depending on the nature of the exposure, there often is a period of time where it's safe to, to wait a little bit to get the care coordinated. And that allows people like Chad and, and, and their team to be involved to help those people make those decisions, allows them to get time to get in touch with their insurance company to make sure it's covered, and it gives the providers time to help make decisions on where they can procure vaccine or where they should refer that person. So um, it's good to talk to the team here at Douglas County on these exposures to help make decisions on how long a person can safely wait before they can start post-exposure prophylaxis. Um, but sometimes I think there's a situation where people tend to rush out and, and try to get it too soon and then they might end up with a pretty big bill that they weren't expecting. I actually, I actually, excuse me. Excuse me. Uh, I actually went asking. through the post-exposure prophylaxis about seven or eight years ago and at the time it was the only option was the ER. I mean call my primary care provider that was and she was frustrated on it as well and then I, I worked with Justin back then. Um, so I know with the the zoo when we had all the exposures, I think we streamlined that a little bit. Hopefully we don't have that kind of a outbreak, but, or not outbreak, but <laughs> exposure, uh, tens enough. Um, so that's something where I, we've worked, looked at it before, and I don't know if we've gotten any further with that. It, it is kind of frustrating to go through it, and it is, it is costly. Um, <clears throat> so the other question I had is the kitten, we, it, all, all I've heard, and maybe I missed some of the news story, was it's a stray, and they don't know the history of it. Have they been surveilling, looking for other kittens in the area? Because I assume it's not just one, or 
Yeah, Chad. Chad's probably got the the the, the best ear to the ground on it. Um, is Chad still on? Looks like Chad might have dropped off. So his team his team did the follow up on it, um, and what I understand from them is that the kitten showed up on a person's doorstep, um, and then that that person um, gave the kitten to another family, and that family was going to adopt it and take it in. Um, it was probably five to six weeks old was the best guess. Um, but other than that day that it showed up on a person's doorstep, there was nothing else known about it. Um, the people then that were gonna adopt it noticed that it had some uh, fur missing on its, on its uh, neck and, and near its head. So they took it to a veterinary clinic here in, in Omaha. And that veterinarian thought that the kitten might have had ringworm. Ringworm is really common in kittens. Um, and he prescribed some ringworm medicine, medicine for the kitten. So they took the kitten home and then the next day it started showing some symptoms of rabies. Um, and they took it to another veterinary clinic then in Omaha. And at that time the veterinarian hospitalized that kitten and then it continued to progressively worsen with its symptoms. And then she um, noticed that it had classic signs of rabies. I think it became aggressive. And then she submitted it for testing. That's all that we know. Um, we could only speculate on how that kitten got here. Um, it's possible that the kitten became infected here in Douglas County. Mm -hmm. um, um, it's probably less likely that the kitten was translocated itself. Um, one of the best guesses might be that its mother could have been translocated, and then the mother gave birth to a litter of kittens here, you know, translocated from the east, was infected with raccoon rabies in the east, then comes here, uh, has a litter of kittens, and then becomes um, rabid and then infected her own kitten. And um, that's why it's very important to have this aggressive enhanced surveillance in case there's more kittens from this litter that are out there. Um, the incubation period for rabies, so the time that an animal's exposed to when they develop symptoms and become infectious can be somewhat variable, um, but it can be weeks to maybe even like three months. And with that going on, we could have other kittens out there that may be strays right now that could potentially be incubating. So that's why we've got this enhanced surveillance going on to try and find it. And, and they are looking for kittens in that first location where they, it showed up on the doorstep? Animal control is, is very aware and there's, and as, um, as Lindsay had uh, said in the press conference, it's very important for the community to, to, to be involved and be looking for these strays or feral cats that may be showing symptoms. And, and uh, Sydney did a very good job of outlining the symptoms that the community should be looking for. And then they can call animal control. You all have a perimeter set up around that house, though. I mean, my understanding is like a, a perimeter of area. I thought I heard yesterday three miles around that place that yeah, you're looking you at stuff. You want to explain that? So that perimeter is mostly referring to what our USDA partners are going to be doing with their um, trap vaccinate release campaign for raccoons, although there may be some other wildlife species that are caught and vaccinated as well in that campaign. We are working, uh, specifically the CDC team is working with the animal control and any animals that are found dead, meaning that someone found it in their yard and called or roadkill are normally part of their process to pick up and dispose of. We are testing all of those animals that are coming in. And then if animal controlled is notified about any animals that are acting strangely and there is not determined to be a human exposure or a domestic animal exposed to that animal, we will be absorbing that testing. The Veterinary Diagnostic Center um, is, has increased capability, so through normal Nebraska rabies surveillance, if there is a human exposure and the animal can be caught and euthanized and submitted for testing, they will do that testing. And then um, Brian has worked very closely with uh, the Department of Health and Human Services here in Nebraska to do some enhanced surveillance in Douglas County that if there is a wild animal that attacks an owned animal, that those can also be submitted through a similar but separate um, system for testing at the Veterinary Diagnostic Center in Lincoln. Mm -hmm. We will only be doing the additional animals that have not had a owned animal or human exposure. And I can add just a little bit to that. Thank you, Sydney. Um, the Department of Health sent a 
Health Alert Network advisory to all the state vets. State Department. State Department. Of the Health. State Department of okay. Health um, earlier in the, uh, in the week sent uh, direct communication to, to all veterinarians um, through the database that's maintained there. It's mainly based on licensure data. And it was sent to veterinarians in Douglas and Sarpy County. And the state has stood up a, a, a separate uh, process by which any animal, domestic animal, that presents to a veterinary clinic in Douglas or Sarpy County, so that's kind of expanded you know, beyond the, the area of the kitten. But any animal that shows up at a veterinary clinic showing signs of symptoms, it can go to the University of Nebraska for testing. And, and that's, um, so that's kind of parallel to the, to the testing that the CDC team is doing, which is gonna focus on animals that have been hit by car, um, found dead, or animals that, are, that come through animal control that, that, are, that are dead. So I, I wanna emphasize that these efforts aren't gonna result in more animals being sacrificed to be tested. <coughs> you know, the, the, only, the only animals that are gonna get tested are ones that are either found dead or potentially have to be euthanized if they're showing symptoms of rabies. So I'm just curious, there was a question asked at the meeting yesterday about uh, raccoons eating pumpkins and transition stuff there. I'm just curious, is there any special precautions people need to be aware of, like with their trash and, you know, raccoons, strays and trash, any, any precautions you would advise for that? Well, I, I, I think that just limiting opportunities for wildlife to be near our residences is very important. So making sure that trash is in sealed containers is very important so that, animal, that wild animals can't get to it. Um, rabies isn't the only disease that we have to worry about with raccoons. There's other diseases that we need to worry about with raccoons. Similar to there's other diseases that we have to worry about you know, with other wildlife. Mm -hmm. And it's important to remember that we've had the skunk strain of rabies in Nebraska for years. And although we've had, um, the state's seen limited numbers of skunk rabies in the past, um, that tends to cycle. And when there's more rabies and wildlife in a community, then there's more opportunities for these spillover events. So anything that the public can do to limit the proximity between their pets or themselves and wildlife is important. So mm -hmm. like Sydney mentioned, if wildlife is acting abnormal, don't approach it. <laughs> don't try to touch it. Stay away from it, call animal control. And, and really try to limit the things that would attract wildlife near your residence. And animal control in Omaha is the it's Humane Society. It's the Humane Society. Okay. Um, is Steve on? Yeah, you could give the number that, that people would call her. Lindsay, do you have it? I thought I almost had he's it memorized, but I don't. Yeah, I'm here. Uh, if they want to reach Animal Control, they should call 402-444-7800, extension 1, and that'll go to our dispatch. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Let me, let me ask you all this. Did, did, does this rise to the level where the incident command was stood up? Internally, yes. Okay. How often do you all meet? Uh, since we were just getting it this, all this going week? in the past week, um, we've only uh, once, um, but we would be meeting frequently, probably at least a couple times a week, if if not more. Um, now the group daily. meets yeah. daily at 7 a.m. Mm -hmm. So we already have uh, we have a kind of a an operations meeting, if you will, that happens each morning at seven, and then we have a joint information center uh, meeting that happens at eight every morning. So we are uh, we are using components of that to to continue to respond on a daily basis. But in terms of like an actual yeah, like the involved? actual IC structure yeah. internally, yes, we're okay. doing that. Okay. Okay. And our CDC team is operating within that structure and and uh, you know just always want to emphasize that we're here we're here on the invitation of the state and the county and uh, completely plugged into that organizational structure and working alongside those partners so i mean i feel the severity of it but i'm just curious can you can you give me what the significance is of this particular form of rabies being like you said 855 miles outside his jurisdiction i'm still trying to grasp that 
what's the significance of a uh, of you this? Take it? Okay. What is the East Coast strain or something? What's the significance of it being here? So in the East, the reason why it is called a raccoon variant is that this particular strain of rabies is um, held within raccoons and widely circulated, so they serve as a reservoir. So this strain is very adapted to raccoons. The raccoons that are here have never been exposed to it, and so they're highly susceptible. We don't routinely vaccinate raccoons here like they do in the East. Um, so I don't want to speak too much to USDA's operations, but they do have a very well-organized um, oral rabies vaccine campaign and a similar where they will come in and do this trap vaccinate release for raccoons and other wildlife to build herd immunity out there and keep the strain from moving west of the Appalachian Mountains. Obviously, we have never done those sorts of operations here because it has not been needed. So we have a naive population of raccoons and other wildlife to this particular strain. We have a very high density of raccoons within Douglas County, particularly in the Omaha metro area. So we are concerned that if um, they were to get this strain of rabies, raccoons are also fairly social creatures and come into contact with domestic animals. And so that could lead to more exposures for our domestic animals, for other wildlife in the area, as well as potentially livestock if they moved beyond the metro area. Um, so that is why we have elevated this response so quickly um, to get on the ground, both CDC and USDA, and are collaborating with the state and the county for this response. We don't want this to become established in the area. And because we don't know the exact origin of the kitten or how it was exposed, that is sort of the urgency behind the response is to one, employ the enhanced surveillance to look for additional cases of rabies that are typed to vac are, are typed to raccoon variant. Um, and then our USDA partners will be working on the mitigation efforts once they are on the ground. I'd just like to add a little bit. Um, in the United States, there's about 5,000 animal cases of rabies a year, and approximately 90% of those are in wildlife. So wildlife are the main reservoirs for this disease. And as Cindy said, in the east, there's, there's raccoons. Um, in the Midwest, we have a skunk strain. Um, bat strain is present throughout the whole country. Um, and then there's also some other um, species-specific strains like for foxes and in Puerto Rico, mongooses. So it's very important to try to control the, the rabies in those reservoir species because they're the ones that maintain it and then that's where the risk is in a community. So if wildlife rabies goes up in a community, the risk to animals, as Sydney said, goes up in a community. And then you know, other animals, domestic animals, livestock, and then the risk to people goes up. So the, the cost of this, if it got established here, could be very substantial, both to uh, the impacts it would have on our animal populations, but also the increasing exposures that people could potentially have. Um, so um, the USDA is very concerned with this Western detection, so far West, and that's why they're coming in very aggressively to stop this if it's here. So I'm just curious to what uh, was said up here about uh, is, a, is the East Coast uh, health structure set up to handle this? Meaning, like, it's not here, so it sounds like we're not, from the conversation that was happening, we're not set up, and people have to go to the emergency room, which is a whole other cost. I'm just curious, is that whole apparatus structure set out East because it's, it's in the East? Is how about how people pay? Because right now it sounds like if we were to get it, we're not exposed to it to a degree that the emergency room is the only deal. Is that structure that we don't have here set out in the East Coast? I'm just wondering. Yeah, I can't, I can't really speak for what each state has as far as being able to respond to, to exposures. You know, what I can say is that each state's going to have a health department and mm -hmm. local health departments, and they're going to be there to help people understand exposures. The USDA is, like I said, spent $500 million to try to keep this mm -hmm. in Appalachia and to the east. Um, if, if you went to their website, there's some really good information about the efforts that they're, they're putting, they've put in place to, do, to stop that. Now, there have been a few incursions west of that line, but mm -hmm. never this far west. But each time they've been ag aggressive, came in and we're able to stop it in a, in a localized area, and that's what we're trying to do here. So 
um, really leaning on on these other partners to mm -hmm. handle that component of, of the response. So what do you think this is a three, four, five month effort? Yeah. The CDC EPI A team will be on the ground through November the 5th to do the enhanced surveillance. Part of our mission and objectives with this response is that we will be training local people, local partners here on how to use this rapid diagnost diagnostic test for animals that are, are not part of the normal rabies surveillance stream to be tested by the Veterinary Diagnostic Center. And so that um, enhanced surveillance will continue after the team leaves. I am assigned here, so I will continue to be here and help to coordinate these efforts with the CDC for additional technical assistance from afar. And then our USDA partners will be on the ground um, for a longer period than that just to finish up their mitigation efforts, but we're still working with them to finalize those dates. So Douglas County will release more information as it's finalized um, in the coming days. So would it, um, I mean, say for instance, if this would have happened April, I mean, do we, is it a little longer because say it happens now, October, November, say the weather hits, gets cold, dormant, and then uh, do we have to be, I guess, I guess a little more vigilant because does uh, cold weather make it dormant for a minute and it could rise back up if it doesn't get handled? We are consulting with both USDA and our local wildlife rehab partners who have very good knowledge of the wildlife species in this area and their behavior. And so even though our response will be limited to the next couple of weeks, the state and the county will continue to do enhanced surveillance through the winter and into the spring to make mm -hmm. sure that if animals are going into hibernation um, and are not as active, and this is still lowly circulating in the population that we will be able to keep looking for it in the springtime once they become active again. Last question. Um, so I did just look at Massachusetts. There's a study, this is from 1995, and the average cost for patients was uh, $2,376 when they had their epidemic of raccoon rabies in Massachusetts. So it's costly. It's, not just, it's not just a couple hundred dollars for folks. Um, but what is that safe time period for people to get that post-exposure prophylaxis? You said it's, I know it's not emergent, but like. Yeah, it, it kind of depends on um, where on the body their exposure happens because the virus will travel up the nerves after an exposure. So if a person's bitten, it travels up the nerves to the brain. And the farther that inoculation is away from the brain the longer it takes so but that's why there's a variable incubation period with rabies it can be weeks to months um, normally we decide that on a case-by-case -case basis and um, kind of based on the wound the severity of the wound um, I generally say though that people can safely wait 72 hours um, unless the unless it's a bite to the face um, but it's best to make those decisions on a case-by-case -case basis and consult with the health department here. They're quali qualified to help the medical provider make those decisions. So it's hard to put a number out that's, that's, that, that's a one-size-fits-all. Um, it's very important to look at each one on a case-by-case -case basis. And the team here at Douglas County is very qualified to help with that. And I want to, to that point, I'd like to reiterate and just to clarify, the state does pay for testing of animals that are submitted when they are involved in a human exposure case. So if anyone is exposed and the animal that they think potentially may be rabid, if that animal can be secured, um, euthanized, and then sent for testing, the testing turnaround is typically one to two days as soon as that is received by the diagnostic center. So part of the routine rabies surveillance that we do in the state is working with the county health departments as well as the medical providers so that they can make their decisions informed on those testing results. If the animal comes back negative, um, post-exposure prophylaxis can be um, avoided and that cost doesn't have to be carried on to the individual or individuals that were exposed. Okay, thank you all. Um, you'll be, so if, they, if people wanna get some more advanced questions, we could, you all will be around for, for a while. So this, this will probably be a regular update for a couple of months. So. 
Yes, Douglas County okay. Health Department is in charge of um, communications, okay. and so we'll, we are working with them. If anyone has questions, they can contact the hotline um, for the County Health Department, uh -huh. and uh, we will be able to answer questions through them. Um, okay, well, help me, just help me align this up. Is you are a federal employee stationed in Nebraska, but you're also the state veterinarian, being a federal employee? Yes, yeah, so I'm 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 assigned here in my normal duties to the state of Nebraska um, as a career epidemiology field officer. Federal employee. A federal employee. Yes. Yeah, so that's why I'm in the uniform. Are you so, embedded in state HHS, or you got a whole separate office? No, I, I work directly at, at state HHS and the Department of Health and Human Services, and I report to the state epidemiologist. So I am assigned here by CDC to work directly with the state of Nebraska for my duties here. and But you're technically a federal employee. I'm technically a federal employee, yes. Okay. So it's very uh, very common um, for CDC to have assignees embedded in state health departments. Okay. Um, it's a way that CDC can provide uh, 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 manpower and expertise and subject matter experts. Mm -hmm. And because I happen to be a veterinarian yeah. who's also an epidemiologist, then the state has asked me to serve in the role of state public health veterinarian. Okay. So I don't, I'm not in the state system, I'm not paid by the state system, but I fill the role. I got it. And, it, and, it, and, and there are, I have colleagues in other parts of the country that, that, that serve the same role in their state. Okay. And okay. I just happen to be able to serve in my home state. So it's, it's, it's I'm blessed that way. Okay, yeah, that, that's what I was, the state thing is, okay, I got it. Thank you for your time. Thank you all. We really appreciate it, and we appreciate the support, and um, just uh, really proud to be working with such a great organization as the, as the health department here. We've been getting a lot of compliments from our federal partners on how well it's been coordinated, and I can't understate that, so Good. thank you. I hope, hope it goes well. All right, let's move then to uh, item uh, B, and uh, Chip. All right, um, good morning and thank you for allowing us to be here this morning. Um, for those of you that I have not met, um, I'm, I'm AJ Anderson. I have the pleasure of serving as the CEO of the Wellbeing Partners. I also have with us um, Sheena Helgenberger, who is our Director of Community Advocacy and Innovation. Um, so a little bit about the Wellbeing Partners. Um, we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization that works with businesses and organizations um, to address local health challenges and to grow a healthy community. Um, we are a small team of seven, um, and uh, the organization is a result of a merger between Wellcom and Livewell Omaha, two organizations with a very rich history of uh, public health and community advocacy here in the Metro Omaha area. The Regional Health Council um, is a council that was formed in 2018 and is comprised of uh, the Douglas County Health Department, the Sarpy Cass Health Department, Pottawatomie County Public Health, and is facilitated by the Wellbeing Partners. Uh, this group was put together um, back in 2018 to really address and strategically plan responses um, around shared regional issues um, and priorities. This council um, has taken the responsibility of putting out a regional community health improvement plan, um, which is not a new concept. However, um, doing this together as a region is fairly new. Um, this is just our second report um, in doing that collectively um, with all the different counties working together. 
Um, so the first plan was published in 2020, and now here we are today with the second plan. Um, a little bit about uh, the process that we've went through to develop this plan and how we've gotten there um, is in 2020 and the early part of 2021, um, we gathered the community health needs assessment, really collecting the data around um, what our residents are experiencing in terms of health and social determinants. Um, later in 2021 and 2022, we shared that data with the community um, through press releases, presentations such as this, social media, and other outlets um, to really just get that information out there. In the fall of 2022, uh, we reconvened with community members um, to really reaffirm um, some of the priorities that were identified in the community health assessment, um, which in 2021, and from those conversations, um, mental health, both in 2021 and 2022, rose to the top as a priority for the community. Um, and so in ways that we were able to identify those priorities and reaffirm them were engaging the community and community conversations, as well as online surveys um, that were shared via email, as well as social media, Facebook ads, and through our community partners. Um, after holding that meeting and reaffirming our priorities for the region, um, we then conducted an environmental scan across partners and across all the different counties to really assess and get a bit greater idea of what work was being done to really address those priority areas, um, which we'll talk a little bit more about a little bit later. Um, and so at the end of 2022 and uh, towards the early part of this year, the council, again, um, those health departments facilitated by the well-being partners uh, began writing the plan that you have in front of you. And for those of you online is also available on the well-being partners website, as well as all of the health department websites as well. So from the community health needs assessment and community conversations, we were able to identify four strategic priorities, again, centered around mental health, as that was the area that rose to the top um, as a priority for community members. And so those four areas that we really wanted to focus our efforts, especially our shared efforts around, were around one, connecting people to increased social supports, uh, reducing the stigma of mental health and substance use disorders, and increasing connections to mental health and preventative resources, and last, understanding trauma that plays into mental health issues, conditions. So a, little high, a few highlights from the report that you have in front of you. Um, we were able to gather input and feedback from over 3,500 community members um, to really help develop this plan and again, guide the actions and strategies that we chose to move forward with. Um, as you look through the plan, um, you'll see that this year, each priority uh, does include an intended positive impact to reduce racial and inequities, as well as some policy recommendations um, to strengthen those efforts moving forward. Um, one great thing that we um, want to share and also want to highlight is that our communities are doing great work and the work that they are doing does align with what this council has identified as priorities. So I'll pass it over to Sheena now, who will talk a little bit more about the programs and the actual work that we have been doing as part of the CHIP and as a result of the Community Health Needs Assessment. Thank you. So just going through some current actions that are happening, um, have been happening and will continue to happen through this plan um, around the priority of connecting people to increase social supports. Um, an example would be a Head to Heart program that has launched in Douglas County to train black barbers and stylists to incorporate mental health best practices into their um, salons and barber shops um, so they feel equipped to respond to clients' needs. Uh, we also have online mental health resources that we have sourced through that environmental scan and our partners um, hosted on the Wellbeing Partners website. Um, and we have a feature uh, specifically around uh, peer support so that people have that social support to deal with mental health conditions and substance use disorders. Um, for the priority around reducing stigma of mental health and substance use disorders, um, we do have a stigma reduction campaign that launched in 2020 that continues called the What Makes Us Campaign. And that is sharing stories of community members who are either um, have lived experience in those areas or allies and advocates. Um, and along with that comes um, messaging to increase education and awareness around those topics. 
And as part of that, we do conduct a formal evaluation um, every year to understand how perceptions, attitudes, and knowledge is changing around the region based on that campaign. So a couple of things that are in the works um, around the remaining two priorities, so increasing connections to mental health and preventive resources. Um, each of the health departments is working to grow the number of community health workers that they have available in the community and would like to develop a shared training around mental health for those community health workers. And then um, the priority around understanding trauma we will introduce um, adverse childhood experience questions back into the community health assessment. Um, we're in the planning stages of that right now so that we can understand a, a current snapshot of what adults are reporting across the region. So there are a number of ways that you can help as an advocate, as a leader in the community, um, whether you're a community member or a public health professional. Um, so one is you can read the report yourself and identify ways that you could support these priorities. We also are doing presentations to community member groups. Um, so if you know of any that would benefit from um, having a discussion with us around this, um, we do have a speaker request form or are happy to take calls and emails um, to work that out. And then we also do um, a mental health roundtable throughout the year, and we have the dates on here for 2024, where we gather community members and community organizations to talk about the latest of what's happening around community support um, and um, programs related to mental health and behavioral health. Some other ways is, I mentioned the What Makes Us campaign, but you can help us increase awareness of stigma reduction efforts by reading um, things from the campaign, submitting a story yourself, or sharing those stories. We have an example of a community member that submitted at the end of last year. We have over 160 stories to date from people living across the counties talking about their mental health experience or ways that they support loved ones and, and friends um, with those conditions. Um, I mentioned earlier the mental health resources that we house on our website that are sourced from all of the things happening locally and nationally, um, but you can um, bring awareness to those resources on our website. And then um, as we look to the next community health assessment um, as a region, um, there will be an opportunity starting early next year for community members to participate in the assessment, so in its origin, it was a landline phone call interview. Um, it is still available via phone, but now will be available um, online as an online survey as well to hopefully increase participation. Um, so stay tuned for more specific details on that way to participate. Um, so that is the brief overview of the community health um, improvement plan around mental health. Any questions? Thank you for that presentation, I appreciate it. Um, so the um, report said for specifically priority one that there um, was, I, it was identified that younger ages um, and some other categories um, were less likely to have someone to turn to compared to others. Uh, the last time we surveyed kind of the younger category, uh, specifically in schools was before the pandemic. Um, and even then, the school districts didn't opt in to have them surveyed around mental health, uh, specifically the YRBSS. I don't know if you're both familiar with that. Um, I'm just wondering what efforts are being made to provide those supports. I, I noticed that you talked about the other ones, which are great. I just didn't know if there were other efforts that you're aware of. Um, and then I have a follow-up question to that, but just wanted to ask. Yeah, so this community health improvement plan um, is specific to adults, um, and the data around it is collected just for adults. There is a pediatric community health needs assessment that is conducted um, that is actually going to be in the process in the early spring as well um, that collects data and then also um, some of those individual health systems such as children's hospitals develop their own chip um, in which they provide the strategies and activities that address youth needs as well. Okay, thank you. Um, to follow up on that, um, what's the age for pediatric like what's considered the for the pediatric needs assessment? Because I mean, for here it says 18 to 39 was, um, 
identified as kind of not having those supports, but we know in the state, 19 is considered an adult. But I just wanted to make sure I kind of understood what those parameters were. Yeah, um, I will say this is my first involvement with the pediatric assessment, um, but from my understanding, I believe it is birth to 18. Okay, thank you. So I guess I'm trying to figure out how this links to like the health systems directly, since it is a priority for all of the areas. Like, why are we not um, collaborating? I guess with individual health systems on these efforts. Yeah. So we actually do collaborate um, with each of the health systems as well as the FQHCs in the area um, to put this plan together, but also to conduct the community health needs assessment. Um, the Regional Health Council is just the uh, body that is leading the efforts, but we do um, bring in all the other health systems as well for their input, for updates on the activities that they're doing, as well as to kind of inform that community health needs assessment and the data that we should be collecting. Okay, it just seems like these should be the priorities for the health systems. Yeah, I would add that um, on page nine of the report, you'll see that um, we've worked closely with each of the health systems. They have all identified mental behavioral health as one of their top five mm -hmm. priorities. So we are in conversation with them throughout the year to see, um, to learn more about the programs or ways that they're integrating like screenings into the way that they do business. Yeah, and then just to further add to that, um, each of the health systems does put together their own plan as well. Um, and there are conversations right now in terms of how we can better collaborate um, on those plans rather than just providing updates throughout the year. So yeah. That'd be awesome. Just to know what everyone's individual plan is for this issue. Thank you. So let me, because well, I, 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 might, I might as well ask it now. I was going to ask it afterwards. I, I must be off on my timing of the, the, the chip because the three-year cycle, it, are we prepping questions now to go out in the field? Okay. So 21 was the prep time where a question was, questions were posed, everything like that. Hospitals, everybody anted up. And around 20, 21 questions went out in the field. All of this uh, is a result of those questions in the field and surmising that. Within the three-year cycle now, questions are being prepared to go out in 24. For the community health assessment. Community health needs assessment, yeah. yeah. Okay. That's what I needed, but all this data is representing still being chewed on from the 21 community health needs assessments questions and still gathering, okay. Correct, yep, and that is why um, we convened community members uh, last year to kind of reaffirm the priorities and strategies and to make sure that the data was still relevant. Okay, all right. So that's the, there might be some follow-up that we might need to ask, I guess, Dr. Jones, because that's the, just understand their role in this. The hospitals are not out like, like last month when Childrens came, they were given an update based on that piece and what they did. And, and the others should be coming individually to give that piece on where they are. So that, that may be something we just need to make sure everybody's on the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would just love to have like a table that has each health system and what they're doing for mental health. You know what I mean? So that it's also reflective. Yeah, yeah. I guess it would just be helpful. Yeah. We'll work on that. Any other questions for well-being partners? No, I just have a comment. Um, I do appreciate from the last report that I saw and this report that it's more clearly spelled out what inequities and disparities are and what the impacts are related to those. Um, I think that that was a, a question and I wanna say more of a concern um, for a lot of folks around that. So I really do appreciate that this is much better spelled out than what it has been in the past. So thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you all. Okay. Yep. Before you leave, though, you want to put that back on gallery? Yes. Uh, okay. <laughs> right. Yeah, you, can you all make that available to yeah. the presentation? Dr. Yeah. Dr. Hughes has our link, so okay. if you can provide that in the minutes. Appreciate it. Thank you. All righty, uh, next uh, C is uh, syphilis update. And this is going to be a fairly fast update um, since we only have about eight minutes. And uh, we've been really working on rabies a lot over the past couple of weeks. Um, so uh, Dr. King, specifically in our, in our uh, last um, administrative committee meeting, had asked for an update on syphilis and what activities are happening around that. So I wanted to 
Um, just give you a quick update, um, just to refresh your, your memories, syphilis is definitely on the rise in, in our community and not just our community, but across the nation. We're seeing higher syphilis rates than we have in, in probably decades. Um, that is definitely concerning, especially when you consider um, that women who are of childbearing age who contract syphilis are able to transmit that to their babies, to their fetuses. Uh, vertical transmission can occur and um, it, it can be fatal for infants. Um, if it's not fatal, it can be life changing uh, in terms of disabilities that it causes. So absolutely is something that we have to have to be working on. Um, this year, we are continuing to, to look at syphilis and actually have kind of rerouted some of our STI control programming to focus our efforts more on syphilis. So um, it became apparent to us uh, that, that this is really somewhat of a public health emergency that we need to be focusing on. Um, we have, um, like I said, we have kind of rerouted some of our activities. Um, we have actually taken a little bit different approach than, than a lot of places do. Um, so we have actually decided to stand up an incident management team and to approach this as an actual public health uh, emergency, similar to what we're doing with, with rabies, similar to what we did with COVID, similar to you know, really any um, big emergency event that would happen in a community. So um, we have a team of people who are uh, meeting on, on a biweekly basis to look at what, what activities are we doing and what we need to do. It's a great structure because it sets objectives, um, action items, um, really, really gives you a very structured way to address an issue. And it also gives you a way to uh, really talk about the different resources that you might need to bring in. So STI funding, uh, especially for control, has been cut. Over the past couple of years, we're expecting more cuts to come. Uh, unfortunately, that means we have less capacity sometimes to, to do that work. And so it made a lot of sense for us to uh, kind of look at this in a creative way and bring more people in the department into that response. Um, so we have, our, we have our ERCs helping with this. We have um, our epidemiology program uh, helping helping with this. We've got um, communications. We kind of have a big group of people that are all coming together uh, to really talk about what needs to happen. So in, in standing that up and deciding, you know, talking through um, what needs to happen and where we need to go, it became apparent that we have data on syphilis, but we don't have enough data on syphilis to truly target uh, the populations who need it here in our community. And so we have started to um, set up a little bit more uh, surveillance in terms of trying to identify what risk factors are present, uh, making sure that we, we truly understand who in our community is impacted so that we can make sure that we're appropriately um, targeting our interventions uh, with our very, very limited resources that we have. Um, we are also planning a number of, uh, of outreach type of um, activities, if you will, to our medical community. So it's important that uh, our physicians in the community understand the importance of testing for syphilis, but also understanding what it means for um, pregnant women and for um, babies who are born to, to women who have syphilis and may have passed that on. Um, it's not something that we have dealt with a whole lot. It used to be unheard of to see uh, you know, a congenital syphilis case, maybe one every couple of years. And, you know, so far this year, I think we've had three confirmed, maybe a little, we might, might be having a few that are um, still, sorry about that, that are still open and, and being worked, but three for sure that have been confirmed. Um, and that, that's a big deal. Um, and so ensuring that our medical community is getting the information that, that they need. Um, we are also experiencing a penicillin shortage. So the treatment for syphilis is a long acting uh, penicillin shot. And because syphilis is kind of running rampant throughout the United States right now, it has resulted in a shortage. Uh, that of course is very concerning. We only have a handful of doses on hand at the health department. 
We've actually reached out to our medical community to find out how much bisillin is in our community so that we can um, figure out, okay, how do we get this to the people who actually need it? And then looking at the second line of treatment and how to appropriately leverage that for treatment. So the second line treatment is uh, doxycycline and uh, we are looking at not only how do we get that uh, into our, our practice of treating people, but how do we get it to people who can't afford uh, to typically get treated. Luckily, doxycycline is not super expensive, and so uh, we do have some more resources, I think, to help provide that for people who need it in our community. So all of those plans are currently in the works. Um, and so, I wanted to make sure that the that the board knows that we we are taking this seriously and looking at it as a public health emergency and really um, adjusting our own internal operations in such a way that we can attack this hopefully successfully. Um, I am very much hoping that we will be a success story across the nation and in, in kind of the the framework that we're using to um, to go after this. Um, there are also some activities planned. Uh, in terms of reaching out to organizations that serve pregnant women and others to make sure that they're getting the information that they need. Um, for instance, I know that there are plans to work with IV Black Girl um, to hopefully work with their Black Doula program and ensuring you know that they understand and and know what resources are out there for women who might need that as well. So. Um, we're kind of hitting this from a number of different angles, and hopefully we're going to be one of the ones who are able to turn the tide and get that uh, rate to start decreasing, and uh, maybe it'll be a best practice for others. Any questions? Um, just a quick suggestion within community partners that we can work with. Omaha Better Birth is an organization that really works with the South Omaha community for prenatal and postnatal care. Fantastic. So Omaha Better Birth. Thank you. you who who are they under? Are they separate? They're a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. All right. Anybody else? Yeah, Please. I have a, several questions. Sure. Thanks for your update. Um, so do you have any data on what the current rates are in Douglas County for syphilis and congenital syphilis? Um, I have 2022 rates, if those will work for you. Um, give me a second here, because I got to switch. Okay, so our rates for Douglas County, um, do you want that total or do you want it broken down by race, ethnicity? Uh, race, ethnicity. All right, can do. Okay, so uh, for 2022, uh, white non-Hispanic was 38.8% uh, of, of the, the total. Uh, black, not Hispanic, 29.8%. Hispanic was 17.9%, uh, multi-race was 6%, and then there's um, Asian, non-Hispanic, 1.8, and unknown, 2%. So um, I know from looking at state statistics that, uh, you know, typically we've seen syphilis more commonly in white men. Um, we're not, we know that we're still seeing large numbers of syphilis in white men, but we're also seeing increases in the rates um, in black and Hispanic women, and I think that is uh, actually growing at a greater rate than what you are seeing with the white males. So we know, uh, we know at least from state statistics that that's somewhere that we likely need to focus. We, we just want to be able to break that data down even to an even more granular level at the local level so that we um, so that we're being very, very smart with our resources. But yeah, um, we definitely are seeing kind of a shift in, in where we're seeing, you know, our typical syphilis cases. That was just the syphilis, not congenital, right? Oh, that was, yeah, that was just syphilis. And, you know, the congenital syphilis is, um, the numbers are so small um, that I, I don't have them because those are usually suppressed when they're under like 10. Um, but they certainly our syphilis rates are, you know, if you, if you, uh, and I think this data was presented in August, maybe, um, you know, it's not, it's not just Douglas County. It's certainly everywhere in the United States that we're seeing those increases, but unfortunately Douglas County's rates are growing at a faster trajectory than what you see 
in a lot of other places. So our goal is to turn that around. So bring those back down. Um, and I also want to be clear that we're not we're not focusing on syphilis to the exclusion of all the other STIs out there. Certainly, we're um, still concerned about gonorrhea, especially because we have resistant strains of it out there. So uh, we are we are being strategic in how we're really assigning out and arranging the work that's happening in that um, investigation and control office. Thank you. Um, also, you mentioned earlier that this is somewhat of a public health emergency. So I'm just curious as to how you're defining public health emergency for this in particular. I don't know if I've actually assigned a, a definition to it, but when you look at the problem and what it costs to treat you know, syphilis and the problems that can come from syphilis. So absolutely, we take other infections very seriously, chlamydia, gonorrhea. We don't want people to, to be having poor outcomes from that. Um, unfortunately, the outcomes from syphilis can be even, I, I mean, much more severe. Um, neurosyphilis is something that can, um, of course, be life-altering and permanent and happen at any stage uh, in syphilis. And so, you know, things like that and congenital syphilis, the re you know, getting into the, that population where you're going to have children who are born with this infection and, and end up, you know, potentially dying or having lifelong disability because of that infection. Um, the severity of that is certainly something that makes us um, sit up and say this is you know these rates are going up and this isn't something that can happen because this is this is going to have long-term negative ramifications for a lot of people um, potentially so I me personally when I say it's a public health emergency I'm looking really at the severity of what could happen if we don't if we don't decrease those rates specifically for those people who are who are having syphilis awesome thank you I still yeah. have a few other questions sorry y'all um, so you had spoke a little bit, or broadly spoke about the process to review these cases. Mm -hmm. um, could you just speak a little bit more about that? You said you had to ingest your internal operations to handle the emergency, so what, what are you specifically referring to? Great, good question. So syphilis is a reportable condition, and it's one that we investigate. So when we get a lab from a, you know, a lab that has a positive syphilis, um, that goes into kind of a queue that we review, and syphilis is a little bit tricky to uh, diagnose, so uh, the labs are not straightforward, and there are uh, several stages of syphilis that are kind of correlated to um, that, potentially correlated to that lab result and then symptoms. So there, there's a lot of kind of behind the scenes work that has to happen to figure out, okay, we got this lab result, what, what stage is this person actually in? So you're more contagious, you know, when you're in the earlier stages, you're less contagious. Uh, when you're in those late, latent stages, you know, people who've had it maybe for years and didn't know that they had it and now are finding out um, may not be as, as contagious as, you know, somebody who contracted it a month ago and had symptoms. Um, and so, what we really wanted to do was ensure that um, that process is happening as quickly as possible and it's being assigned out as quickly as possible. And then we've uh, actually assigned one of our disease investigators who is also a registered nurse to be a coordinator. So that person is looking at those, all of those syphilis cases, especially those congenital cases and making sure that they're expedited, that we're, we're um, looking at those um, on a priority basis. Um, so, and, and there, there are quite a few cases that have come in and um, of course there are complications with trying to get a hold of providers and things like that. And so uh, we, are, we are just looking at all of those procedures to make sure we are as efficient as, efficient as possible in uh, investigating them as fast as possible. Um, so with that, once a person is tested for syphilis, how quickly are they notified and how do you notify them? So it's really the responsibility of the provider to notify someone. So if they've tested them, they should be notifying them. But we also recognize it doesn't always happen that way. Uh, we, once we get our test, it's usually, um, it's usually assigned out within like a day. Um, to a DI, and as soon as they're getting it, you know, within a day or so, uh, maybe two, they're they're starting to make phone calls to providers, um, 
you know, they try to call the provider first to get information. If they can't get to the provider, then they'll call the patient themselves. Um, so sometimes I think we do end up having to do that notification. It's usually, um, you know, after verifying that that is in, in fact the person uh, on the phone who you're talking to. Um, and then we go from there, you know, essentially explaining what it is, uh, how, it, how it transmits. And then we do ask questions about partners. Um, you know, we want to try and identify partners that might need to be tested and treated as well. So all of that process happens um, once that DI gets that information. But it's upfront, it's usually, you know, a couple of days uh, between when we get the lab and when they're starting to make those phone calls. So if they come down to the health department to be tested mm -hmm. for STIs or specifically syphilis, they don't get to find out from you all about their positive test results. They have to wait to hear from their provider? To... No, no, no. If they're tested in the community, if they're tested by their provider, that's who would be notifying them. If they come to us, absolutely, we're the ones who are notifying them. Um, because we are we are the provider. So if one of our nurse practitioners has administered that test, we're going to be the ones that that are calling them as soon as we get that lab result. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's what I was asking about. No. Um, thank you. And then you also spoke about there was a cut that happened for STIs. Mm -hmm. What was the cut? Um, over a five-year period, we have been cut by about 91%. So we went from having $892,000 in that program. Um, in fiscal year, I want to say that was 2021, uh, we had a subsequent cut down to about 518,000. And then this year, we don't have our funding uh, for, for 2024. We don't have our funding yet, but our application was uh, approved for between 50 and 75,000. So we went from basically 892,000 several years ago to um, a 91% cut down to if we're lucky, 75,000 with that. Um, so your next question is gonna be, well, what are you gonna do about that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're, you're ready. <laughs> that is a good question. So the first answer to that is, uh, of course, and I do also want to tell you that um, HIV funding, while it hasn't been cut, we've been asked to go longer with the amount we're given, so it's essentially a cut. And then we are waiting to hear on our STI grant um, whether we are going to have a significant cut there too, because that is federal pass-through dollars, uh, and and those were cut through the debt ceiling bill. We don't know if we're getting anything there. So that's another four hundred thousand right there that could be going away. Um, what I've done is sat down with my fantastic budget office, and I have to uh, just shout out to Jerry McKay because she's amazing. Uh, we sat down and looked at, um, you know, okay, here's, here's where we're paying our staff from, here's where we're running uh, our operations from, what are we going to do if we don't have this money? I'm able, most likely, to cover everything through the end of June. Um, and so that's the good news, but the bad news is I don't know yet what I'm going to do about after that. Um, I am in some conversations with some, um, some funders in the community. I don't have any kind of commitment or solid answer for you yet on that, but we are absolutely looking for uh, funding and, and kind of really raising the alarm and letting people know that, hey, you know, we have this major issue with, with not just syphilis, all STIs are increasing, um, and yet we are, we are being asked to respond to that with um, a great, re greatly reduced resources. So um, we're hoping that we can shake the couch cushions and, and uh, find some, par some partners in the community that can help us resolve that. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm aware that the other STIs are also um, increasing mm -hmm. at a pretty quick rate, yeah. uh, chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis, and HIV. Yes. So have you notified the community about um, this increase? And um, if you haven't, do you plan to do that and when? So I know that at a Board of Health meeting um, over the summer, we did talk about STIs quite a bit. Um, and, and I know that that was covered also through news outlets at that, at that particular time. I know that there were some interviews that happened at that time. So you know we'll continue to talk about it with the community. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, last question. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that there 
um, were three confirmed cases and a few open. Can you give me an exact number of how many cases are open and kind of what's the time period or average time period to close those cases will be? That's going to vary quite a bit depending on, um, you know, how quickly people are able to get those investigations finished. And if there's, so if they're receiving treatment, they stay open until they're completed with the treatment. So, you know, if they've got to get several doses or, um, you know, sometimes someone gets their first dose and then doesn't come in for the second dose, so you got to start them over, unfortunately. So there, there are a number of things that can that can impact how long those those are open. Um, for the congenital syphilis, I, I don't know off the top of my head how many are open at this time. Um, Jamin, however, has been supervising that program for the last month since Leah is out with her new baby. So he, thank you for being here and hopefully he has maybe some more information to share. Yes, I do. So be we quick. currently have um, be quick. one. Be, be quick. Yes. Okay, we currently have one open congenital syphilis investigation um, that we are still working on. Um, we have 105 open syphilis investigations. Most of those are are staged at uh, as late latent. Um, we you have said it's what latent. Late latent. What's that? Um, so what, that what are you? So that means that it's a it's a syphilis. It's a potential syphilis um, infection that is at least a year. A, a year older, older. So it's a person that's potentially been infected um, and has remained infected for over a year. And so the the risk of, of transmitting infection is decreased um, and they may not be exhibiting those symptoms anymore. Um, we have, um, in so far in 2023, we've had um, 45 primary and secondary syphilis investigations. Um, and my apologies. And we currently have 105 open syphilis investigations. Thank you. Yeah. For now. Any other questions? All right. Um, All right. Let's see. Any uh, questions for staff on the reports? All righty. Um, any body want to follow up on anything that needs to be going to the administrative committee in November? Huh? Anybody has any items they want to follow up on in the administrative committee meeting the first that's set for the first Friday in November? If not, I just need to know so we can know what we're doing with public notice. And if so, then please get them to me in the next week here. Um, we got to go into executive session for a personnel matter real quick. So to the public, we won't be taking any action when we get back. So I, is there a motion to go into executive session for personnel? Uh, Dr. Jones, uh, is that a motion? Did I hear you? Yes. Okay, is there a second? Second, Dr. King, uh, roll call. Yes. Yes. All right. All right. I just need the board in the back.
Uh, all in favor say aye. aye. All right, so you all at this, get it to me.